hello and thank you for tuning in. We are back with part two of the article by Sandra Cock and Whiteley. This journal article is entitled, How to Do High Quality Clinical Research, Part One, First Steps. This was published in 2018 in the International Journal of Stroke. The next section that we will peruse is Select and refine a good question. Deciding what research to do is the hardest part. Topics for research are identified in many ways. And a detailed description of how best to choose a good question, refine it, and turn it into a study design that will ensure the question is answered reliably is beyond the scope of this short article. But we set out here some key principles. Now the authors here have encouraged us to check out table three. A, select a good question. Make sure your question is clear and important to you and your colleagues. Think about the most important question that you have the skills to address. The question will need to motivate you. Think of a question that is answerable and reasonably focused, e.g better ways to put in an NG tube, rather than nebulous though laudable, e.g. find a new treatment for acute ischemic stroke." Unquote. B. Consult widely to identify high priority questions. Medical colleagues can help identify live questions that are important to their daily practice. Patients can help prioritize the questions that are most important to them. For example, top 10 priorities for life after stroke. The World Stroke Organization has also identified priority topics for stroke research. The research summaries of Cochrane and other systematic reviews often identify important questions. C mentorship and guidance from an experienced researcher throughout your career is invaluable. This may be a senior colleague in your own institution or someone from another institution who can support you. The burden of negotiating the many research regulations and getting all the approvals required to do your study is much easier with the help of an expert or a colleague who has done it before. Ensure your question has not been answered already. One needs to be sure that the question has not already been reliably answered. A look at the database of research in stroke, which is abbreviated as DORIS, D-O-R-I-S, and their site is www dot askdoris.org, the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, and PubMed will help you to determine that. Failing to do so can lead to a huge waste of resources. And I might add, in biomedical ethics, we always talk about the scarcity of medical resources so that no matter how large a company is, we always want to treat those resources, those monies, as if it were our own. We want to do the best budget available so that we are not guilty of wasting limited resources. For example, investigators of aprotonin, a drug to reduce bleeding in cardiac surgery, did not adequately cite previous research. So a large number of trials needlessly replicated research that had already reliably answered that question. So D is really important. You have to ensure that your question has not always already been answered. E, a systematic review of the completed research studies relevant to your question is a good place to start. First, make sure a review has not already been done. If there is no existing review, doing a good systematic review will quickly make you an expert in the topic, helpful for writing grant applications and when defending your research plans. This will tell you if the question has already been answered reliably. 
often it has not. What the flaws in the previous research were, and hints how to design your own study to avoid those mistakes. Many grant giving bodies will not fund new research on a topic if the applicant has not done or cannot quote a relevant up-to-date review. F. Choose the right study design. Once you have an idea of your question, think about the most appropriate study design. The choice of design will depend on the question the resources available, time and money, and methodological support available in Table 4. And once we're done with this article, we will go through and review the contents of each table. Both of us began our research careers with observational studies in which we acquired practical skills in questionnaire design, data collection, and analysis. Now that is my area of expertise, questionnaire design data collection and analysis. Three articles in the series cover the key problems to deal with in three common research designs, systematic reviews, observational studies, and health services research, in parentheses, audit, registers, and quality improvement programs. Designing and running randomized trials is a topic that is vast and beyond the scope of this getting started in research series and is not covered. The final article in the series deals with doing research efficiently and doing it in resource limited settings. G, design your study to ensure it answers the question reliably. This is where methodological input from epidemiologists, statisticians, and others is important. Don't think that because you have a good statistics package installed on your computer that you don't need advice from a statistician. Statistics packages, however, cannot rescue a bad study. So if possible, discuss your research question the parameters of your hypothesis, your idea of the best research design and sample size, the data items you plan to collect, and the plan for analysis with a statistician or methodologist before you start to collect your data. Now, I always have to reiterate that the best research teams are those who have multidisciplinary clinicians, scientists, historians, writers. We need all disciplines on these professional teams. I especially love the mathematicians and the statisticians. As the article is stating, no matter how good you are with math, no matter how much money you have spent on your statistical program, always consult a human expert in that field. This will help you to focus on the essential. Avoid collecting too much data and ensure that when you perform the analysis, the results are interpretable. This is true whatever kind of research you do. H, consult widely to get comments on your research design. That, that goes back to that peer review process. We don't work in silos or in a vacuum. We always go through the process of having five, seven, or 10 people to analyze our work and to be critical. So you cannot have thin skin or get your feelings hurt when you're doing this type of work. We have a patient first focus in this, in this time. We don't wait until we are three quarters of the way through designing a study before we go and we find out what low income or moderate income mothers are thinking and fathers. We get them involved at the ground level since these are the people who will participate in this statistical analysis and this collection of data. We want their input early. So clinical research is in the forefront. We are on the cutting edge of doing patient first research 
and taking that data and pushing it out to the clinical side. We want patients to be first, to be consulted first, to be acknowledged first, and that is formulating better research. There's one thing that I want to say about clinical research in America. The majority of our research, whether it's drug studies or device studies, the majority of that research is performed overseas. And the question is why? People think that only African Americans are leery of the government, and that is just not true. Americans in general are leery of the government. Our spirit of independence, our spirit of autonomy keeps us from just submitting ourselves to another authority, especially a higher authority. So many of the research studies are being done in South Africa and other places in Africa, India, where people are more likely to submit to the terms of research. So that is another reason that we are really pushing patient first research design, because if we have that input early on, we can find out what kind of bias patients have against the healthcare system, and we can remedy those early on in the design process. Back to letter H, consult widely to get comments on your research design. Input from consumers, patients, and lay people helps to define key aspects of how to seek informed consent and was very helpful in the third international stroke trial, IST3 and the SOS trial of oxygen supplementation. Lay involvement informed many aspects of the design of a trial of intermittent pneumatic compression for venous thromboprophylaxis, CLOTS-3, and enabled a much wider variety of patients with acute intracerebral hemorrhage to be included in a randomized trial of trinexamic acid, TICH-2, that comes from Sprig in personal communication. Making sure the study answers the question, that's the next section. A, consider piloting to examine acceptability, feasibility, and to hone the study protocol. Our pilot studies have taught us both how important it is to keep things simple and to collect only essential data. Remember, there are a very large number of freezers full of unanalyzed blood samples for biological markers that just might be useful someday, but never get analyzed. Before moving to a larger definitive study, Small-scale pilots are really helpful to assess the feasibility of recruitment, study procedures, cost, and design. Plan and actively manage your research. Section B. Before you start, set a regular time slot in your weekly program for planning and project management. It is very important to do this so you can give adequate attention to planning and managing your research not easy and a busy clinical job, but important. Reviewing study progress and problem solving with colleagues who are helping run the project. So it is helpful to be familiar with the basic concepts of project planning and management. Much of this is common sense, But a quick internet search for project management will give you an idea of what to think about. So you think of everything you need to do to complete the project and then put activities required into a logical sequence. A Gantt chart is actually helpful. Uh, it's graphical and it's a way to set out to do this. In other words, set a plan for the end from the very beginning. C, make sure you meet your recruitment target. Many studies do not recruit their target sample size. Such underpowered studies are often uninformative and hence wasteful. 
The effort put into streamlining and simplifying the study, its various data collection and trial management processes will help to ensure you meet your recruitment target. And we'll talk a lot later in this series about recruitment. Small scale feasibility studies that roll directly into larger scale studies without interruption of recruitment are very helpful to maintain study momentum in randomized trials, but can be equally useful in non-randomized study trials. The last section, analysis and reporting. Transparency in research. Publish your methods before you report the results. It is important that we are all as transparent as possible about all aspects of our research. Whatever field of research you study and whatever research design you employ, you should aim to be as clear as possible about your research methods. Nowadays, that means publishing the details of your methods and at the least publish the research protocol that has been approved by a relevant research ethics committee. The Equator Network provides extremely helpful guidelines on the reporting of study protocols, final reports, and other data for a wide variety of health research design in Spanish, English, and Portuguese, www.equatornetwork.org. Thus, authors writing a Cochrane Systematic Review cannot begin data collection until the protocol has been accepted for publication. The International Journal of Stroke publishes selected high quality protocols of stroke trials, e.g. ASPREE. -E. The Open Access Journal Trials, www.trialsjournals, and that's trials, plural, journals.com, publishes articles on general trial methodology, as well as protocols, commentaries, and traditional results papers, regardless of outcome or significance of findings, including reports of trial progress and protocol changes. In addition, it improves transparency to finalize and publish the statistical analysis plan before analyzing the data, e.g. the recent ATTEND trial. In summary, following this guidance on transparency helps to improve the quality of research and facilitate the publication of results. B, data management and study monitoring. If you have streamlined your data collection that will ease the process of managing and cleaning up the data before analysis. If you're collecting a lot of data, you will need the help of an experienced data manager. If you have written a protocol and statistical analysis plan that includes the format of the tables and figures, you will present in your main publication that will inform the design of your data management system. In other words, make sure that the data management system can generate those tables and figures at the touch of a button as soon as your data collection is completed. The data are clean and ready for analysis. Hint, speak to the programmer who designs your data management system at an early stage in the project to make sure that this will work. One of the worst things that you can do is to spend time collecting the data and when it's time to push the button to have the graphical analysis done and the beautiful tables, things just don't work. When we collect the data, the end goal is to make sure that the results can be interpreted and we can take that out to the public, we can take that out to other research teams and everyone understands why you spent 18 months doing the work that you did. The data manager will be able to keep an eye on the quality of your accumulating data and give advanced warning of problems such as missing data, patients lost, follow-up, etc. If such problems emerge, act promptly before things get out of hand. See analysis. 
The statistics package you use is not critical, provided you have a good grasp of the analytical technique. Generating large numbers of different statistical tests on a set of data can A, make interpretation of the results difficult, B, risk finding false positives findings, and C, risk failing to appreciate negative, false negatives rather. There are many packages to choose from. R, free, good for large data, more difficult to learn. S, data, modest costs, easy, easier to learn, and there's plenty online. SPSS, expensive, tempting to perform too many point and click analyses. Think carefully about which package to learn and take advice. Unless you become a statistician or data specialist, you probably will only have time to learn one. So make it the right one. One clinical, one critical feature rather, is the data visualization tools that come with the package are graphics and particularly good. And finally, research projects invariably never run to plan. So if possible, build a team to support you. The team will be especially helpful when it comes to crisis management. You will need to be time efficient, stay determined, and always remember that for all the quote unquote dark moments you may experience, your mission is an important one to improve the care of people with stroke. Now, I cannot go any further without always bringing to the forefront the language. One of the uh, great black philosophers always urged us to examine the language. And I really dislike when anything that goes, anything goes awry, anything does not go plan, it is considered deep or dark or any negative terminology against darkness. So let's beware of the language. And in research, we want to correct some of this language. Now, we get a lot of flack for highlighting that, but we are unafraid to continue to highlight the quote unquote dark moments. We want to take that negative stigma off of darkness. Next section, declaration of conflicting interests. The authors declared no potential conflicts of interest with respect to research, authorship, and or publication of this article. Funding, the authors received no financial support for this article, authorship, or publication. Neither did they receive financial support for the research. Supplementary material, a list of additional resources can be found online with journals.sagepub.com and there are a plethora of resources that have been used. There are 26 other articles that have been cited and quoted in the publication of this article. If you've just joined us, we are in the process of doing a literature review on the article. There are a series of five articles. We've just completed the first article and it is entitled, How to Do High Quality Clinical Research One, First Steps. The authors are Peter Sandicock and William Whiteley. The article was published in 2018. Now we will go through and just backtrack on some of the information in the tables as promised. Table one is entitled Selected Online Courses for Training in Epidemiology. So if you need to do a review of epidemiology or you need to get some initial training in epidemiology, study.com has a list of the top free online epidemiology courses. There are some e-learning packages prepared by the University of Nottingham in basic epidemiology. There are free lessons from the LSHTM distance learning epidemiology course. And there are also some fee paying courses, epidemiology by distance learning. There is a certificate, a diploma and an M 
MSc from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. There's an MSc in Epidemiology at the University of Utrecht and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Epidemiology, the Basic Science of Public Health. Many of my mentors in the Delaware Valley trained at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Also in Duke University has great uh, research courses. Selected free online courses. This is in table number two. Learning statistics relevant to clinical research. Medical statistics. Understanding clinical research behind the statistics. That's at the University of Cape Town. Dr. Juan H. Klopper. Cape Town is in South Africa. Stanford University, Introduction to Medical Statistics. Basic General Statistics, there's an introduction. Udacity, www.udacity.com. Basic Statistics at the University of Amsterdam. Table three is interesting. And there's just a bullet point list of how to identify and refine your research question. Identify sources of potential topics for research. Your supervisor, everyday clinical observation at the bedside or in the lab, completed clinical trials, systematic review of all relevant studies, implications for course section of Cochrane Reviews. Research priority setting exercises. Government and research funding agencies. Refine. Ensure the question is important because it meets many of these criteria. The association of burden of disease is large, either across the population or for individuals. The problem is common. It causes much death, disability, or misery. It is very costly for the health system and the individual. B, other people agree it is an important question. The public, patient advocates, and charities. Politicians, something's got to be done because it is traceable, because it is tractable, rather. Health professionals, it is a priority research topic for funding or other bodies. C, the research finding can have an impact on patient care or disease burden. They will apply to many people with the condition. They will be easy to apply, feasible and both practical. Application will be affordable in routine practice. Design. The research has been designed to provide a reliable answer to the question. Measures of outcome are clinically relevant. Sources of bias are minimized. Sample size is adequate. Minimize random error. Analysis appropriate. Report of results designed to meet relevant standards. Table four, pros and cons of different types of study. Study design, retrospective case note review. The pros, they are easy to do. The cons, they are prone to multiple biases. Prospective hospital-based registry. The pros, easy to collect large numbers of cases. Also helpful to monitor use of treatment. There are many cons. It may be biased if case ascertainment is not complete. Collection of sy systematic data and complete follow-up of the data may be difficult. No controls, so unable to assess the effect of treatment. And lastly, very time consuming to do well, and it has a definite cost whether measured in money or opportunity cost. 
case control study. The pros, they're helpful in initial assessment of causation. Collection of cases is usually straightforward. Cases and controls can be collected in a reasonable time frame. The cons shows association but does not prove causation. Many potential biases and collection of controls, potential for bias and data collection, e.g. recall bias. And I will say this, that even in, in the study that I designed, the McKellar Longitudinal Women's Health Study, I am a participant in that study. I do my data collection all throughout the day. Even though we have good memories, days get distorted. You work long shifts and you have to figure out, did I have a hard time remaining alert and awake at work last night? Or was it the night before that? Or did I have a headache last night at work? Well, actually, no, that headache was today. We want to be as accurate as possible. So definitely recall bias is a problem for case control studies. Prospective cohort studies. The pros are it can provide less biased assessment of relation between exposure and outcome and the cons, it can be expensive. Another pro, there's potential to include nested case control study and another con, it takes a long time to accumulate cases and outcome events. Randomized control trial provides an unbiased assessment of the benefits and harms of treatment and the con, developing a trial protocol, obtaining funding and completing trial recruitment and follow-up may take five to 10 years. Again, when people say they have done the research, many of us have been researching disease processes, managing uh, people and processes for many years and we still don't have all of the answers. So be careful when someone says, I've done the research and now I've made a decision. We never make a snap decision or a snap judgment. We always consider as many sources as possible. And when I'm doing a literature review, I was taught in a class called um, Writing for Healthcare Professionals that to do a proper literature review, you must have a minimum of three articles. So you have three different articles that have been published by three different teams on why black women are dying in America. So once you have three different articles, you have three different perspectives, then you can look for those gaps. Table five, we're almost to the bottom of the table. So we just thank you for being patient and for going through this article with us. If you are on the go and you need to conduct a literature review about stroke, we've actually just done one with you. So you just need to find two more on strokes and then you have the minimum number required to do a satisfactory lit review. Table five, general tips on planning and reporting your research. Choose an important question and define it clearly. Collect only key items of data to answer the question. This reduces cost and makes large sample size feasible. Fewer missing data to check and chase up. Simplifies analysis. Keep the research procedures simple and easy to follow. Complex procedures lead to errors. Research participants are more likely to participate. Colleagues are more likely to help and support. Design the two or three data tables and one or two figures that you will use to present the results in your main publication. Record and store data in a format that will allow you to easily generate these tables and figures. Make sure your data are secure and regularly backed up. You will need to experience at least one episode of major data loss to realize how important this is. Writing the paper, Keep it short and simple and make the messages clear. This is most important. What was known before this study? 
what this study adds, implications for clinical practice and for future research, and adhere to the reporting guidelines specific to your study design. So if you don't remember anything else from this particular journal article, you want to remember these messages. What was known before the study, what this study adds to the current body of data, implications for clinical practice and future research. Remember, your research may be a stepping stone to help the next team of scientists actually answer the problem. Adhere to the reporting guidelines specific to your study design. Thank you so much. If you have any questions about the journal article that we have just reviewed, you can send us an email at vthecampusofcare at gmail.com. Also, our phone number is 1-888-74-WOMEN. That's our vanity number, 1-888-74-WOMEN. The actual number is 1-888-749-6636. All of the links for this journal will be in the description box, as well as all of the training organizations where you can go to get additional training all of that information will be in the description box and we urge you to go to that description box. Increase your skills if you are a medical technologist, if you are a nurse, if you are a statistician, whatever your role is on the clinical research team, please follow us on this journey. People have reached out to us to ask us what we advise for people who want to improve their clinical research training. I will tell you that it is not an easy process. There is a lot of reading and writing that are involved, that is involved rather. There's a lot of calculations that are involved, but you can do this. Thank you for tuning in. Dana McKellar Intaka, Woman of Science, Woman of God.